All right, dope. All right, guys. So today here we have Luca Nets. Uh, the guy made a lot of money on the internet, made a lot of money on Web3. We're going to be going over a little bit about him, how he made money on the internet, and he'll be going over his story. Also, he'll be, uh, he'll be sectoring a little bit of the focus on this podcast on Web3. So we'll be going over that also. But besides that, Luca, very nice to have you on today. How are you today? I'm doing great. How about yourself? Doing good, man. Yeah. So tell us a little bit uh, uh, about yourself. Let's give a little bit of an introduction for who Luca Nets is. Yeah, just a, a brief rundown as I'm 24 years old. I've been an entrepreneur for the last six years. I have no formal education background. I'm actually a high school dropout. So not many people say that, but for me, it was uh, kind of the right approach. And uh, I've been uh, selling stuff online for a very long time. And now we're selling NFTs. Dope, man. Dope. Yeah. So as you are the founder of Pudgy Penguins now, uh, we'll be going over that later. Um, I think there's some really interesting topics about you because I did watch a few of your other podcasts that you did. And I think that there's some uh, lessons that a lot of people can learn that are going to watch this. So um, what I really want to go over now is like, how did you get involved in the internet money game? If you want to start with like where your roots are with internet money. Yeah, I think uh, one day I was just watching a course uh, or an Instagram ad and some guy was like, my little brother made $5,000 a day. And at the time I was making like $5,000 a month. And I was like, dude, no way. It's like, his little brother was like 15 years old. So I bought the course, the course sucked, but it told me, or really showed me two things, uh, which was Shopify and a Burla, which I didn't really know existed at the time. And so I went down the rabbit hole. I couldn't believe that I could sell any product in the world without having to actually like have inventory for it. And like this whole automated process. And so I think like, though the course didn't teach me anything, it did show me like what this world was about. And so I went down the rabbit hole and I thought to myself, I was like, one, this is a genius idea. And two, if there's other people doing it at a high level, I can too. Uh, so I started my first business a couple months after that, selling fake gold chains and cubic zirconia diamonds to kids who wanted to look like their favorite rapper and um, hit it off right off the jump. In a matter of days, we went from $500 a day to $10,000 a day to $100,000 a day, um, which is pretty amazing. And so uh, that's kind of how it all started. That's sick, man. Now, um, I'm, from, from what I've seen, you also were pretty big in e-com. You did a lot of things with, with, with e-com and like uh, influencer marketing, celebrity marketing. Um, how did you directly like get into that and like what were some achievements and like I guess you could say what were some things that really stand out that like I think people would really recognize as like a big uh, as like a big accomplishment on, on your end yeah so being young in Los Angeles making a lot of money I was integrating with other young kids making a lot of money which in Los Angeles really means like influencers and celebrities and I actually realized that they didn't have as much money as I thought they did and they had millions of followers but they didn't have millions of dollars and it was really strange to me and so Kylie Jenner had just became a billionaire off of Kylie's skin or was making a ton of money off of it. Same with Rihanna and Fenty. And I thought, well, there's a way to do this, but on a lower level. And so I decided to make brands and merchandise um, around influencers likeness. And so we ended up absolutely killing it. I did that business for about three and a half, close to four years. And uh, it was just an absolute money printer. And so like kind of my advantage is a lot of people, you know, see me and like, kind of like, how did I get to where I am? I think it comes down to like providing value to people. At the end of the day, I solved a huge problem for influencers, which was how do I make money off of all these followers? And in turn, you know, when you make money with somebody and you make money for somebody, uh, you kind of develop a relationship that's bigger than a friendship uh, and it become more powerful and it opens up a lot of doors. So I think that's kind of how it all started. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's definitely great. And I've dealt with, uh, you know, whatever celebrities and influencers too. And you start to realize that, you know, when you're in the environment around them, everything's very flashy, but not all of it is very real. Um, I found out the hard way many times gotten scammed by bigger people too, knowing that they don't actually, or they, they're not as big as they actually make themselves seem, but obviously what, what you've done is pretty sick. And I think that a lot of people can definitely learn from that. Now I want to get into, um, I guess you could say some like tips or some, some, some tricks for, people who really want to get into like the um, making money or making internet money or providing value to others online. How do, how do people like get involved with that? And how do people start uh, providing value for others online on the internet to make money online? I think it's just kind of developing a core skill and being really good at it and then providing value and realizing that you have to sacrifice uh, to kind of get through the door. And what I mean by that is like, there's a lot of kids that have came to me 
and, and they'll attest to this, but like their lives were changed because of their interactions, you know, with each other, you know, myself and them. And it all stemmed back from they came in and did something that I didn't know how to do and they did it really well. And then that opened up doors, right? It's not what you know, it's who you know. And if I look back at all the money that I've made, I think 10% of the money that I've made is was based on what I knew and about another 90% was based on who I knew. And so I think it's a, you know, people need to understand that life is a relationship game. And, you know, there's no better way to build a relationship with somebody than to make them money or to provide value that helps them make money. And so a lot of people are kind of lost. And I would really recommend just honing into a skill, whether it's web design or Photoshop or cold calling and sales or CRO conversion, you know, metrics, right? Or funnel building or creative making, like whatever that may be, be really good at one thing that you actually enjoy doing. And then reach out to people who are actually crushing it and extend your services and, you know, impact their business in a positive way, i.e. impact them in a positive way. And the more you do good by people and the more people you make more money, the better off you will be in the long term. Yeah, this is something that, that I've heard from a lot of people too. And I think that the process for most people is just getting started, execution, just getting out there, putting yourself out there, learning skills, become someone that's valuable. Why would anyone want to be around you if you literally don't know anything or get no skills or if you don't do anything, right? So of course, for, 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 for everyone listening, you got to just start somewhere. And that just means reading a book, fucking going on YouTube, uh, learning a skill, anything, right? Um, and Luca, uh, it seems like that you're seems like that you're a a, a person that's really uh like aware of your actions and like aware of your of your surroundings by the like the way that you talk. It's really really nice to, to see actually. Um, why exactly do you have the um the board and back you? Is there like a reason behind that? Like, does it help you structure your day? I'm just kind of curious because I like to pick these like little things out of people. So why like what do you do like with that board? And I know it's a dumb question for some people, but I, like I'm 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 trying to learn actually. Yeah, I mean, I think just like life, you know, the one of the most important skills that I see a lot of entrepreneurs failing at is just like organization and like really understanding your vision. So like the board behind me, I think, is really to organize, you know, certain ideas that I have when they come. Uh, and I also love to like write down my vision and like different ideas. I'm a big consolidator of ideas, and I think that's important. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't pay attention to this as much as they should. Uh, but organization and having real clarity on what your vision is, I think are two things that that whiteboard helps to solve. And I think they're two things that a lot of entrepreneurs need to do better. Yeah, I think uh, the whiteboard sales on uh, Amazon are going up right now as, as we speak after this, this video. <laughs> but um, yeah, guys, get a whiteboard. But um, I know I'm, I'm probably we're probably going to be, be skipping a lot of your life because we're now we're going to go focus and like shift into like the the Web3 topic, because I think a, a lot of people want to hear about it and like see how you got into it and all that. But um, exactly when did you get into Web3? Like, why did you get into Web3? And like, what did you see in it when you entered in in this space? Yeah, so I'm just a huge collector of things. Uh, I've been collecting stuff ever since I had money. And my mom actually kind of refers to me as a hoarder which was like a negative connotation, but it was kind of true. Like I wasn't dirty, but I was like hoarding cool stuff. And so when NFTs came around, I was just like, oh, this is just a better way to collect, right? Like when you look at it, what it really means, you look at it from a macro standpoint, it's just like, if you're a collector, why buy a sports card when you can just buy an NFT, right? And so I've, I've been a huge reseller of things for a very long time. I actually invested in a sneaker store in Los Angeles. So I understand that business. And so when the, you know, 16 months ago, when I caught wind of like what NFTs were, I just thought to myself, oh yeah, like this is the future and I'm going to participate. Okay. That's sick, man. And like, was there any person that like got you into it? Like, did you hear about it? Like on like so social media, was it like YouTube? Like how exactly did, like, did you come to find? Yeah. I think Twitter can be your greatest superpower. Twitter is, you know, the, you know, if you follow the right people, Twitter can be, you know, an edge. So I, I found it on Twitter. So I'm assuming like you were on crypto Twitter before and all that, right? Yeah, I've been on crypto Twitter since like 2016. Okay, yeah, I mean like that's where this, again, like a lot of people say the smartest people on all of crypto are there. And I do agree. I've been on crypto Twitter for quite a bit too. And uh, yeah, like have you learned anything directly from like some people? Like is there any people that you think that are like really, uh, again, I don't want you to spoil your alpha. Maybe there's people with lower followers that you follow that you don't want other people knowing about. But like, is there anyone that's like in, in, in particular that might be uh, more reputable or like that they have really good advice that you would want other people to check out on Twitter? 
Yeah, I mean, it's funny because like Crypto Kaleo is now like a pudgy maxi. And so like that wasn't by design, but like people don't know, like I've been following Crypto Kaleo for years, you know, like he's been somebody that all of us have been, a lot of my friend group have been following him for a long time. So I think that would be an example of just somebody who like sees the future and just like sees things before everybody else. And I'm just like, oh yeah, at least from like a charting perspective. Um, you know, I think it's it's less about like the individual and more just about like following a good group of people of like a couple thousand people and then just like just seeing things. And, you know, I'm always somebody that like when I see something that I don't know, I research it. So like a lot of people see things that they don't really digest it. Like if I see something like if somebody's posting about a coin, even if it's like not a famous person, like if it's on my feed, like I'll do a minimum like go to coin market cap, search the coin, like go to the website, understand what it is. And if it clicks it, like it goes, you know? Understood. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent, man. That's uh, definitely something that other people can take, take into, into consideration when they're browsing on Twitter too. Also, uh, I guess digest what you're looking at a little more and don't just scroll through everything and like just burst through everything. Um, now talking about your trading strategy. Um, I did hear on another video or another podcast that you were on that you did make quite a bit of money trading NFTs. If you want to tap onto that, I think that'll be great. Maybe we can go over some like strategies that you use or like maybe you got an early. If you want to tap on that, that'll be great. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I, I got in pretty early and I felt like I was buying the right things. You know, on the PFP side, it all started with Pudgy. So like I turned like 15 grand and I mean, a lot of people in Web3 don't really know this. But, you know, you did because you watched the Jordan stuff, but like 15 grand to like maybe five or six million dollars. But how it kind of shook out was a little interesting. So like I bought like 60 pudgies at like a hundred dollars and then I was selling them when they were like eight, nine, ten thousand. So I ended up, you know, making almost close to a million on pudgies. And then I rotated that money into apes and doodles, which weren't that high at the time or not necessarily doodles, but like apes and like cool cats. And then I rotated into doodles and then like ape, you know, for every ape that you owned, you know, early on like that, I held pretty much all of them. So like with airdrops and stuff, you make like probably like two, $3 million of that is coming from the apes, just giving you free money. Uh, so it's like, it's not as impressive because you think like, I didn't like trade like 800 trades. It was really like six or seven high conviction trades. But I think when it comes down to trading, like that's how you get rich, like, you know, scalping and doing that stuff is difficult, but the, the best advice I ever got from a trading perspective was you only need a couple high conviction trades to go right to like set you up for life. And I think that's kind of how it shook out. Unfortunately, I had like 40 mutants and I sold them, but way too early. But like that would have probably been like the nail in the coffin on the on the NFT trades if I would have held them. Holy shit. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's that's pretty wicked, man. I think a lot of people can can learn a, a lot from that. And I, and I want to tap onto that a little bit more in, in, in a second. But pretty much every person that I know that it's made like like at least three to $15 million on trading NFTs, they all have their money in Yuga some way, somehow. And they all made at least a big chunk of their money on Yuga. For me, I'm like the only guy that made, you know, a decent amount without even buying Yuga assets once. Uh, I've actually never owned any Yuga assets. Pretty, pretty crazy. But um, yeah, pretty much everyone. So that goes into the same same exact story as uh, a lot of other people. You rotated your money correctly, made the right trades correctly over and over and over. Um, and again, I wouldn't like say that this will happen again because like other people are waiting. Oh, what's the next doodles? What's the next board apes? I genuinely don't think it'll happen anytime soon. Uh, but I think Pudgies was like, the, was like the closest one when all the FUD was, was coming around and all that. Um, and then obviously when, when you bought the company, uh, it, it like re resurfaced a whole new type of uh, energy around the project. And I think a lot of people loved it. Then in the, you know, in the bull market, I mean, in the bear market now, a couple of months ago, Pudgy's just completely took off. So um, that's sick. I'm, I'm going to, I'm, we're going to tap into the Pudgy acquisition and all that in a second, but going back to the trading strategy stuff, um, what would you say are like your, what was you, what would you say is like your biggest lesson from like trading NFT so far? And like, what would be like your biggest tip for, for people? Yeah, so to be frank, I got, I got kind of lucky because like my thesis now is like, like I, in hindsight, like you would never invest in something where you don't know who the founder is. And like, if I would have listened to that advice, I would have never bought Yuga, right? But like, I think my strategy today is a little bit different than it was before, right? Like I usually, like I just bought things that I liked and that I got and that I thought like made sense in certain environments, like I bought a bunch of pudgies. My thesis was when I bought pudgies as my first PFP collection was 
this could be the biggest brand. Like this is universal. Anybody could identify with this, right? A man, a woman, every ethnic group, every age range. So I was like, oh yeah, this is a no brainer. Uh, but my, the my strategy today is different than what it was before. I think before it was just things that I liked. And then today, I think I'm a lot more critical on what I think the norm should be in terms of like what you invest in. Um, so unfortunately, like, to be honest, like the NFT trading stuff, I literally just trusted my gut and I got lucky, like, you know, to say that Board Ape would have made the money that it did, or some of these projects made the money that it did. Like, it's like almost unbelievable, you know, if you were to own 10 of any of these one blue chip assets in the middle of a bull market, you could have completely changed your life. And I think I just kind of got lucky and I just saw like certain things on the, on the wall. Like today, if I were to trade NFTs, I'd have a completely different approach. Like, I think the space is plagued with just like anonymous characters and bad actors. And I'm just like thinking, I don't think that can be the future long-term. And so, you know, I, I honestly can't trade NFTs now. Now I just buy NFTs that are like my friends and, you know, people that I meet in the space that I like, and I just kind of hold them and maybe one day. Yeah, I can trade them, but probably not, you know? I would say I have pretty much the exact same thing now. I think a, a lot of people that made a lot of money in the bull market are kind of doing the same thing right now. Like maybe, okay, I'll buy a friend's project here and there if they want me to. But besides that, I'm not going to really do any crazy heavy trading. No more swooping floors, all that shit. It's dead now. Um, but yeah, besides that, I just kind of like look into like some exclusive groups, maybe, maybe for access at this point. But besides that, yeah. really not, nothing else. But um, now going into like the, the trading stuff, one more question. Um, did you, were, were you like in any certain groups or were like, was, uh, were there any certain friends that helped you make these trades or was it just all like, again, you said your, your, your gut feeling, or was there like a group of friends? Like what was going on there? Yeah. So I, I have some alpha chats that I created just like, like my inner circle group that I've like been working with, with for a long time. And like in hindsight, it probably was those alpha chats that like pointed me in certain directions. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was kind of. Yeah, probably the alpha chats. Uh, yeah, just sorry I didn't include that, but to think back about it, the alpha chats convinced me to buy apes at 30 grand. And I was like, no way. And then I ended up dropping like four or 500 Gs on apes. You know what I mean? If it wasn't for that chat, it, it was definitely my network. Again, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So attributing back to that, I think that my alpha chat specifically convinced me to buy apes. So in hindsight, that would definitely play a huge part of it. No. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I tell people at least be in like some type of group, like you, like you can't just do everything on your own. You're going to eventually be blind to something. So try to be in groups, try to be with groups with, you know, people that you trust people that are not going to just going to dump on you when they tell you to buy something. Um, but yeah, going into that now, uh, here's the topic that I think a lot of people want to hear about now, uh, pudgy penguins. All right. So how did you come about to purchase pudgy penguins as a company and as a project and can you explain how that whole process worked and like like who, who did you buy it from and all this I, I think a lot of people are really curious about this so if you want to tap on that that'll be great yeah so i just saw some people on twitter bidding on the ip and i thought to myself well like you guys don't build brands so why would you buy pudgy penguins when at the end of the day pudgy penguins to me always had the highest upside to be the biggest brand in web3 and so I made a tweet basically adding Cole, who is the original founder of Penguins. And I basically said, hey, look, I'll buy your project for 750 ETH. Let me know if you want to do it. Unfortunately, he didn't take me seriously. But a week before, I was on a boat with one of his childhood best friends. And so a couple of days later, his friend hit me up and was like, hey, are you serious about this bid? I saw your tweet. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, OK, I'll connect you with Cole directly. He thought it was a joke. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's definitely not a joke. Uh, and so I got connected with him. We went through the process. Unfortunately, there hadn't been a deal that had been done like that in the past. And so it took a little bit longer than I thought. My lawyer was like, hey, I'm inventing case law here. Like there's nothing to reference. So bear with us. It took about two and a half to three months. And then after the negotiation and the paperwork was done, we signed it and uh, we took over on April 4th. That's sick. So um, you also took the little pudgies also, right? Yeah, I took the I took everything. So any copyrights, any trademarks, any socials, any contracts, any and all collections, little pudgies, pudgy rods, and pudgy penguins. That's sick. So you guys, uh, was there any type of treasury in there? Did you guys get like the royalties? Like how how does that work? Yeah, so we bought the money. We bought the the company with zero dollars in the bank, which again 
puts us in a little bit of a tough spot versus other collections, but we knew what we were signing up for. Cole and team put a little bit of money in. I think it was like 30 or 40 ETH to kind of jumpstart us. So we weren't at zero, which was nice. Uh, and then, yeah, I mean, and then we kind of, yeah, but we bought the money. We, we bought the business with no money in the bank and, you know, whatever royalties we made from that day forward was kind of what we made. Awesome, dude. Um, now going on to like your presence on Twitter, which is obviously undeniable. You guys have like, you know, you guys are basically one of the strongest uh, projects, one of the strongest brands on all of Twitter that I've seen for like the past couple months. And even before that, you guys are one of the, like, obviously one of the uh, original projects that I've like been around and like everyone knows about. Right. So that's sick. But Going on to like a different approach that I've seen you guys take on, on Instagram, you guys do have a pretty good presence on uh, Instagram. And I see that it's like a lot of positive messages, a lot of like positive quotes throughout the day and everything. From, from what I would say, you guys probably have, if not the biggest or second biggest presence on all of Instagram. So um, why did you go, why did you decide to push on Instagram? And like, what's that all about? Yeah, so I think everybody's caught in a Twitter rat race. I think projects are just chasing after the same audience over and over again. And I have really no interest to do that. Like I want to cater to my core Web3 audience and give them utility and value that they think is valuable. But I think from the long-term perspective, the people that are going to win are going to be the people that suck in the outside groups and bring them in. Uh, and so when you look at Instagram, Instagram is probably the biggest social media that and TikTok in terms of like bringing people on. And I don't look at, you know, Pudgy Penguins like an NFT project. I look at Pudgy Penguins like an IP company, right? And how would you build this? Like you would build Hello Kitty or Pokemon or Coco Melon or Pepe the Pig or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Like I'm going to, I'm trying to build this the same way that you would build one of those, not how do I build the next Board Ape in Yuga Labs, right? Because I think Board Ape is like a one in a billion. And it like a lot of what Board Ape did I think was really well timed, right? I think the universe blessed them in that regard. And obviously they did a lot of really good things on their end. I think their execution was phenomenal and a lot of you know initiatives that they pushed for, they did a really good job. But like that type of rollout with that type of utility only works in a Pico bull market. It doesn't really work uh, in a bear market. And so like, I wanna build a brand that can impact people far beyond Web3. And I really believe that Pudgy Penguins is going to play a huge role in terms of onboarding the masses and bringing people to be a part of this. That's that's amazing, man. Um, now, going into like, I guess you could say like the next big moves for, for Pudgies, like um, a lot of people are trying to learn, especially a, a, lot, a lot of the stuff in Web3 is like uh, experimentation and all that. A lot of people have never even built a brand. They just have a project that somehow has a decent floor price. That happens a lot, right? A lot of people just FOMO into certain things and all of a sudden the project's on the spotlight. Now with you having experience in like brand building and all that, I think a lot of people can, can, can take advice from this. Now, like what are your first initiatives or what are your first things in mind currently at this current moment to push Pudgy like to the next step, you know, to that next uh, mainstream step where like, I guess you could say the average person can look at it and resonate and be like, oh yeah, that's Pudgy Penguins. Like what is your, um, what is your, what is your plan to make that all come to life? Yeah, I think it starts with consumer product goods. Right now, I think no NFT project is really looking in this direction. I think they're not looking in this direction because making money digitally is really easy to do and making pro you know money in the physical realm is a lot harder. So I think there leaves a lot of low hanging fruit there for somebody like me to come in and you know build a really good you know core consumer product good business. Uh, and I also believe if NFTs are going to win, they've got to trailblaze and somebody's got to trailblaze and put these IPs in places that they haven't been before, uh, which, you know, I think if NFTs are going to win, they can't just live on the blockchain. And two, you have storytelling because at the end of the day, like what is, you know, a PFP without a story? Like it's like if, if what's Chewbacca without, you know, Star Wars, right? Uh, it's just another character. And so I think storytelling is a huge part of it. And then I think three, just kind of leaning into your community and just providing value. Like one thing I'm really keen on is just bringing all the value back to my holders, like in whatever way I can. Uh, and so those are probably be my three main initiatives right now. Awesome. Yeah. I think a lot of founders try to do like, oh, passive income, buy our project and all that. But obviously you're taking the brand first approach and obviously trying to expand the IP as much as possible, which is sick. And I really do 
appreciate and respect that. I think a lot of people um, are probably looking in the wrong direction for their project. They have a lot of funding. Now they're trying to look how to grow it. And they're probably trying to drop another project or whatever. You seem like that you have everything in place. Now, in terms of the cash deal that, that you got with Pudgies, um, do you think that you, got, that you got a steal? Like, how do you feel about that at this current moment? Oh, yeah, I stole it. I was so happy when I bought it. Two and a half million for Pudgy Penguins. Like, if you really know the NFT space, you know, that's like, I mean, Doodles just raised it a $700 million valuation. I yeah. mean, think about it. Like, <laughs> how much better is Doodles and Pudgy Penguins? Like, actually, like, ask yourself that. Yeah. Not, yeah. I mean, you could, okay, if you if you think they're ahead, that that's fine. That's your opinion. But like, how much more ahead? Like, they're 10 times better than us, 15, 20 times you know, even if they're 20 times better than us, like that's still valuing Pudgy Penguins at $35 million. And like, if you think Doodles is 20 times better than us, like you are like not paying attention whatsoever. Yeah, I think uh, Board Apes are like, what, like a multi-billion dollar valuation, like what, 4.4 billion or something crazy, right? So when I when, when I saw you buy that, I was like, holy shit, this guy got the, the deal of the fucking year. And, uh, and honestly, I think that uh, you'll do well with that. And it seems like that you know what you're doing, obviously, too. Um, just from this, you know, looking at your interviews, seeing what, what you've been doing on Twitter, talking to you here. Uh, I think Pudgies will have a very bright future, right? Now, going into your next big moves for like Web3, like what you see happening and all that. Again, this is like more so like, like a closer statement, right? Um, what are your next biggest moves in Web3? And like, where do you see everything going with this space? Yeah, I think uh, I think where I think it's going and where it needs to go, I think are two different things. I think Web3 is stuck in a loop that I don't think is healthy for the space. And what I mean by that is I think trans utility is too transactional right now. I think utility is emotional. If, if NFTs are going to win, utility has to be emotional. Right now, a project won't do anything for six months. They'll airdrop you something and it's worth two ETH. And then everybody's like, oh my God, so much utility. You did such a great job. When in reality, they didn't do anything. So I think the bar needs to be higher in that. But again, it's because there's this precedent of like degeneracy that's like kind of plagued the space. And so I think where NFTs have to go is they have to go into the real world and real businesses have to be made. And if that can't be proven and that can't be shown, then I think we're going to get caught. And I think we're already caught in this like flywheel of like ponzi nomics, as I kind of refer to it. Because when you look at it, like if utility means airdropping something and you selling it, that's a Ponzi scheme, right? Like if that's what utility means to you and to a lot of people, that is what utility means, right? But like utility has to be more than that. Utility has to be, you know, impact. Utility has to be, you know, community, utility has to be content, utility has to be, you know, a bunch of things that is not me receiving an airdrop and then selling that airdrop. Yeah, no, 100%. I think it's just too, too easy for some like marketing companies and all that just to uh, re reproduce over and over airdrop this that it, for for people who don't know, putting together a smart contract to airdrop all the holders, all this shit could probably cost a couple thousand dollars max for like a good dev, right. And then on top of that, the art get the art for the airdrop. Maybe it's like a 10 K project that costs about another three to $4,000. Right. So, um, you know, if your project's airdropping you shit for no reason, without it having any reason, just know that they didn't really do anything to help you guys out. And yeah, I think you're, you're, you're completely right, right on that. Now, um, going into like, a like, like a final statement or like more so, uh, like some tips or advice that you, that you can give people who are trying to like get started in web three, uh, what would you tell them? Yeah, I, I would, don't come into this space thinking you're going to do something right off the bat. I would totally get experience and be a key cog in a machine, but don't be the machine. And what I mean by that is play your role, join a company, join a project, be a part of it, but you don't want that responsibility for creating and founding something and it going south because the long-term ramifications are not worth the short-term gratification. And so come into the space because it's the future, but come in ambitious, but not overly ambitious and learn how to play your role for six months. And once you understand the real gravity of what you're signing up for, then go off and create something if that's what you choose. But I've, you know, I've made millions in probably seven or eight different business models from SaaS to B2B, from D to C to info to like, you know, I'm one of those few guys that's really dabbled in a lot of industries. 
this is by far the most complicated, you know, like there are so many moving parts. And if I hadn't been a part of all of these companies that I've been a part of over the last six years, I think I'd be in a really tough spot. And I really empathize for a lot of founders today more than I did, you know, eight months ago, because like understanding all of the moving parts and all of the dynamics and all of the personalities, I mean, it's not for the faint of heart and it's definitely not for a first time entrepreneur. I'll tell you that. Perfect, man. No, yeah, I would probably give something similar. Take your fucking time. There's no rush. And at the, at the end of the day, you're going to make a fool of yourself if you're trying to like launch a project really quick and all that. It's not going to end up well for you. And it's not getting any easier to launch a project at this current moment. People are learning more and more because the same pattern keeps happening over and over with Ponzi-nomics. So uh, take it easy, guys. But besides that, Luca, anything on a, on, on a personal statement, uh, any, any last words, any word of advice for, for anyone on a, on a personal level, maybe for their, uh, for, for their health, happiness, for their mind, anything? Don't give up. Don't give up, guys. Fucking get up, execute, and don't give up. Luca, it was a pleasure, man. Thank you so much. And see you later. Thanks, Samir.